Howdy folks! Welcome back to this Teen Punk Desperado channel. This is the place where we talk about all things sci-fi and fantasy, but with a special emphasis on that most wonderful subgenre, steampunk. Today I continue with my series of top tens in various, various types of sci-fi niches. Now today my topic is time travel. It's a subject that's been popular with science fiction for a very long time. As you'll see with my list, uh, it's been happening for over a hundred years that people have been writing about it. And uh, it makes, makes sense, it's time. Interestingly enough, uh, time travel as a topic in novels is forbidden in mainland China. So, if you have a special hankering to tell Chairman Z, uh, ruler for life, <laughs> where to get off and what we think of him, definitely Read a, read a time travel novel and enjoy that for yourself while we can in our free country. So my list involves a lot of things you may or may not see on a regular list of novels. I look up a lot of these on the internet and it's interesting because sometimes there are things that aren't truly time travel that people have just put on there because of the title. For example, Wrinkle in Time. Fantastic children's books, but book by Mad Madeline Langle, Langle. Uh, one of my favorites as a kid. However, it's not about time travel, it's about dimensional travel. So some of the ones you may expect may not be in there. Another consideration is that certain books that involve time travel, I've considered maybe that it's more of a device than the, than the central theme of the book. For example, Outlander, which is a pretty interesting uh, series of romantic type historical tales that got made into a streaming series, uh, pretty cool, and I actually happened to have the chance to meet the author, Diana Gabaldon, many years ago, but I'm not putting this in my list because I think that's more of it, it's more of a historical romance. And I will proceed without further ado. Selection number 10, City Beyond Time by John C. Wright published in 2014. This is a pretty interesting tale. It's about a mystical city, Metachronopolis, in which the rulers are the masters of time. And in a way they're kind of like time lords from Doctor Who, but they are, but they are not well-intentioned. They are very selfish and corrupt. They steal famous people from history, people like Socrates and so on, and bring them to their world outside of time for their own amusement. And it's, it's kind of an interesting tale. It's, it's a little bit confusing. You go back and forth and it deals with the topic of a man meeting himself in a situation where he actually becomes his own enemy. So it's, it's pretty interesting. If you like the kind of mind-bending time travel stuff, that, this is a book for you. Number nine. Here's a classic. I'd be amiss if I didn't include it. Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, a.k.a. Samuel Clemens, written in 1889. Now this is a novel, one of, the, one of those uh, archetypes where we have American know-how meeting uh, superstition and uh, old-time old um, stubbornness of Europe. So the hero here, who doesn't have a name, goes, gets sent back somehow uh, by being bumped in the head. <laughs> uh, I don't know how that works. He refers to it later as transmigration of souls or something like that. He goes back to uh, the Britain of King Arthur's court and spends a very long time there becoming familiar with the world and bringing American ideas to England. It's full of a lot of Twain's signature humor, a lot of the dry observational humor that I love so much. It made me chuckle a lot. The downside was the, the, the hero, who styles himself the boss when he becomes King Arthur's right hand, the hero does a lot of rants about um, American democracy versus the uh, badness of old day, old time monarchy and especially the rule of the Catholic Church. Because remember, this was before Henry VIII. And, and the Reformation and all that stuff. So it's, it's nonetheless, it's a good book, uh, very absorbing, a lot of detail, a lot of, 
a lot of crazy adventure in the alternate history of medieval England. Number eight, and here is one that we will see on many lists of steampunk because it is often considered the first ever steampunk written by uh, one of the men who kind of coined the term, coined the term and invented the genre. It's called Morlock Knight and it's by uh, K.W. Jeter in 1979. And this is a sequel to H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. As you may expect, that occurs a little farther up on my list. And in this novel, the Morlocks, uh, shaggy brutish people eaters from the far future, they, re they steal the protagonist's time machine and they come back to Victorian England to plunder the place and eat the people and so on. And so it's, it's a struggle to defend England from this external evil, and it melds in the idea of King Arthur, <laughs> and which we just mentioned. King Arthur as this savior, this mystical savior of Britain who comes back at certain times when England needs him. And so it's kind of cool, and, and the protagonist is not the, not the time travel hero, but he's this, I believe he's the same man who narrates the first, uh, or narrates the H.G. Wells novel, and he it has to try and change time back. This is one of those novels where you can change time and he sees this horrific post-apocalyptic London where everything's ruined and wrecked and people are dying and he has to change it back to the to the genteel and prosperous London of his day. Uh, kind of short but highly recommended. Number seven, The End of Eternity by Isaac Asimov, written in 1955. Asimov is one of the grand masters of science fiction, and he was one of my favorites when I was growing up. And I hadn't written any Asimov, read any Asimov for a long time. It was, it was a little jarring getting used to his rather dry style, but it's it's kind of interesting and amusing. It's a very 1950s type milieu, as a lot of that the fiction from that time was. The, it posits a again as in the city beyond time. It's a it's a world or a dimension outside of time uh, where we have these bureaucrats in this case uh, and it's an organization called Eternity and they are kind of like time enforcers. They, they keep human history on path and they, and they keep human beings from destroying themselves with nuclear war or whatever and they only deal with the time from the invention of time travel in the 24th century up till when humanity mysteriously disappears, something like seven million years in the future. And so they deal with this huge, huge um, span of centuries. The protagonist is Andrew Harlan, and he's one of those um, technicians, which are, which are highly feared, because they're sent back as kind of enforcers. They're sent into the particular centuries to change things, to maybe abduct somebody or move something around in order to uh, change history just enough to prevent a war or whatnot. And of course, they always, they're always tweaking it because one change produces another and it, it, just, it just never ends. <laughs> and so he has the misfortune of falling in love with a uh, young aristocratic woman named Noyes Lambert. And uh, he discovers that an upcoming change is going to eliminate her so she was never born and he can't have that happen. He wants to bring her into eternity so she can be his wife. However, that's forbidden. And as a matter of fact, there are essentially no women in eternity. It's only men. It sounds chauvinistic, but the explanation is that, is that um, women are too important to be pulled out of time. They, they may have children or whatever that, that influence history and therefore they need to be left in the time stream. So it's, it's an interesting and rather adventurous tale, and it ends with a kind of a theme of uh, liberty, human liberty versus safety, <laughs> and uh, which is really relevant to this day of uh, COVID-19 and, and lockdown, so you would probably appreciate that. Uh, number six is Paradox Bound by Peter Kleins, published 2017. Its protagonist is Eli Teague, 
and he is a, a kid growing up in, in 1980s, I believe, New England, if I remember correctly, and he encounters this mysterious young woman who calls herself Harry. She's driving a Model A Ford, <laughs> suddenly appears, and she's been chasing, chased by these sinister, faceless men. Uh, kind of reminiscent of the, um, of the characters from Matrix, only even creepier because they have no face. And he gets, he is obsessed with her, he keeps searching for her, not realizing that she's a time traveler. Eventually he encounters her again and she takes him in with her and he becomes one of those time travelers. What they're doing, there's a kind of a loose organization, they are searchers. They're searching for the American dream which has been stolen by the evil faceless men. The American dream is kind of a symbol or a thing represented perhaps by the Declaration of Independence or some sort of artifact, but it, it's like the American spirit, the American uh, dedication to justice, etc. And they have to get that back. And so there's, there's this kind of idea of conspiracy by Freemasons with, with Egyptian gods involved. But that, that's actually kind of a positive con conspiracy because a lot of the Founding Fathers were Freemasons and they were trying to set things up so they'd have this great society. And so it's, it's fun, it's, it's exciting, and a little, a little violent in places, but it's definitely a good, a good um, book for young people. Number five, here's one I recently encountered, and uh, the title was, the title's kind of dumb, but the book itself is a lot of fun. Just One Damn Thing After Another by Jody Taylor, published in 2013. And uh, this takes place in Britain, and it's very reminiscent of some of the great British comedies, uh, you know, British series, you know, kind of like Doctor Who, etc. But in this case, it's this, this um, organization, this um, institute called St. Mary's. And they are supposedly historians and they recruit people from, they recruit historians from uh, various uh, grad students and so on. And, you know, you think that was a boring occupation, but as it, as it actually happens, they're traveling back in time to learn more about history. And one of the things they do is they preserve artifacts. They put them in places that they can be retrieved and so that people can find out, find them in the present day and uh, learn more about the past. And it's kind of, it's kind of a quasi-government agency. And so one of the themes here one of the time travel themes is that time protects itself <laughs> and that if you try to change history, it'll kill you. <laughs> like one guy gets, one guy tries to save a child, they go back to some, you know, medieval time, this child is going to be run over by a, by a carriage and he tries to save this child and he gets run over himself or I think killed by some flying object. The hero is Madeline Maxwell, aka Max, and she's this spunky young woman uh, very, uh, very uh, fun. She's a strong female character. She uh, is, uh, she's smart. She, and like the others, she kind of, she, she likes to drink and party, and so it's a lot of fun. There's people are having affairs and stuff, so it's more a little bit more adult oriented, and, and I like that. It turns out there are people who split from the institute and are and are in for doing their, um, for making their own fortunes from this and they're going to do some really bad stuff. And Max is in peril and I really recommend it because you'll have no end of excitement with this book. Number four, we have another steampunk from the list of the most amazing steampunks. In fact, I listed this one as one of my top 10 steampunk novels. It's called The Anubis Gates by Tim Powers, published in 1983. And this book is another one of those where time is kind of inflexible, <laughs> uh, but it actually can be changed. There actually is a danger of it being changed. And Professor Brennan Doyle is like one of these one of these uh, historical nerds that's been that's being recruited by this shadowy character, a uh, common theme. And he's a literature professor, however, from California. And this guy, Jay Carpentero, is a billionaire who's invented time travel, and he has this time gate 
that you can go back into specific times with, only it's very specific times, I think having to do, I'm not sure what, if it's like what, having to do with solar flares or something like that, but there's only very specific times you can go back and, and you can leave with. If you don't make it, you're stuck. So they go back to at the time of uh, Coleridge, one of my favorite poets, <laughs> who wrote uh, Kublai Khan. And uh, they go back and have a bunch of rich yuppies are going to go back and see uh, Coleridge read some of his poetry. And uh, they, and something goes wrong and Doyle gets stranded in early 1800s Britain and encounters all these crazy villains. Some of them from, you know, early British urban legend, like this guy named spring Hill Jack who who lived down in the sewers and he had these springs on his shoes and he'd come after people and he'd kill them. <laughs> and it's, it's cool this historical, this dedication to historical uh, folklore that, that plays a very strong, a very strong point in this novel. There's also the idea of people who go down in the sewers to find lost items for money, which was a real thing, I guess, people who did that. So we have a, a threat from Egyptian gods that have discovered that they can also tra travel through time and through this um, sinister Dr. Romany, like this gypsy character, and they're trying to uh, establish their own kingdom over over Britain in the 1800s, and obviously they're going to change time. So this makes it kind of a, a threat that uh, Doyle has to try and and uh, overcome, and also he has to get back at a specific time, otherwise he's stranded. You know, like another seven or ten years are going to pass before he can try to travel again. So number three, number three is Timeline by the great Michael Crichton, 1999. And this is another one of these stories where you have a billionaire who invents time travel, or his company does, and he recruits these uh, medievalists to go back in the time for him. The company's called ITC and they're a bit into high-tech uh, superconductors and quantum computers, and they can travel back, and it's mostly to like to make money, I think, with artifacts and with restoring buildings for tourism and so on, and one of their professors gets stranded back there, and this is in uh, France from the 1300s during the 100 Years' War, when the, the British were invading France. And so he sends back these three, uh, three characters, these three grad students, Chris Hughes, Kate Erickson, and Andre Merrick. And each one of them has their own strengths, and they're supposed to, they're supposed to rescue this professor, but of course things go wrong and they get stranded back there and they have to survive and survive until the time machine is programmed to come back. And for some reason I, that I don't understand, the people back in the present can't change that because you could think that they would, they could come back the second that they got stranded, the second that, you know, their, um, their guardians, they have these military type guardians that get killed by some of these evil knights. And you would think that they could do that, but they can't. So that it's, it's really interesting, and a lot of the historical accuracy here, including the fact that they're not speaking French, but Occitan, and so they have to have Occitan-speaking professors back there, and, and also uh, translators that go in your ear for the people who don't speak it. It's, it's very exciting, uh, like, like, like a lot of these stories are. keeps you interested. Number two. And this is, I just love this story when it came out, by one of my favorite authors, Neil Stevenson. This one, however, was a collaboration with Nicole Galland, who I think writes historical novels. And it was published in 2017, The Rise and Fall of DODO. And DODO is a top secret U.S. government agency involved in, what else? Time travel! <laughs> and it's like the Department of Diachronic, or Diachronatic, operations, excuse me if I can't remember precisely what this is. They find that the shtick here is that magic was real, but it's gone out of the world because of technology. Technology kind of made it go away, ending in middle of 1800s, 
at the same time as the Crystal Palace exhibition of you know science and technology in London, which is for us steampunks, that's one of our favorite favorite things to talk about is that wonderful exhibition with the glass palace that unfortunately was destroyed later on. Anyway, the they discovered this that that uh, magic was real, so they hired these these historical experts in uh, folklore and so on, and they are looking, pouring through these manuscripts, and what they discover is that there's this witch who's like hundreds of years old, she preserved herself with magic, they're going to look for her so that they can have her bring back magic, and it's something to do with quantum mechanics and physics, they build this chamber that isolates her from our universe into a mini-universe where she can perform magic, which involves time travel. And in this novel, you can only travel naked. <laughs> For whatever reason, you cannot bring out back any artifacts. You can only you can only send the human body. And if you have like fillings in your teeth, they fall out when you go back. So the hero is Melisande Stokes. She was this um, student of lore of magic and, and you know history and so on. And she had this love interest, Tristan, who's this dashing government agent. She gets sent back and stranded in uh, Victorian England and is trying to get back and there's all these all this all these machinations with uh, the witch who has her own agenda <laughs> she makes herself young and pretty and she's she's like trying to bend things to her own will in this case they can change history in fact that's the whole point the US government goes back and is subtly tweaking things like for example they make it so that uh, the Russian Federation did not did not um, annex Crimea. And so they're doing little subtle changes like this so that to give the US advantage in the world stage. It's very, very good, works, it, the technology rings true, and uh, I can't recommend this highly enough. Now to number one, and I bet you all can guess what it is. The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, 1895. It's a rather short book, more of a novella than a novel, and it it sort of started the, the um, craze in time travel and sci-fi, even though you may have noticed that uh, Connecticut Yankee did get written and published earlier. But that was, I think, considered more of a fantasy. So Wells, he was just a master of sci-fi at the time, and this inventor, who is not named, invents this machine that it's kind of almost like a little bicycle, <laughs> or there's like this saddle, like on a like on a bicycle, or a uh, carriage, and this giant dish behind it that manipulates time. At least that's the way I remember it from the movie, because there's been many movie act adaptations of this. He travels not back but forward to see what's going to happen, and here's where he, he encounters these um, two races of humans, uh, the uh, beautiful, peaceful Eloi, and he falls in love with one of their women, and the evil, brutal, flesh-eating Morlocks who live below, they're all shaggy, and they use the Eloi like cattle. And so he has to escape from them. Of course, he wants to save Weena, his love, but anyway, he ends up going to the far, far future near the end of the human, well, past the end of the human race into the end of the earth when the sun is a red giant and there's all these you know, giant crabs crawling around. It's, it's really creepy but kind of depressing but it's very thought-provoking and it's, it's why I think this novel is so beloved because it was such a jump forward in the idea of you know human history and the way that it could be portrayed in science fiction. So that's my list of the top 10 sci-fi novels. I have an honorable mention here and uh, this is this is a an anime that was based on a video game <laughs> by Nitro Plus and usually those are horrible but this in this case was really good and because there was no actual normal novel involved in this I consider this an honorable mention it's called Steins Gate and it was aired in 2011 and the writer was Judd Hanada and direction, directors Hiroshi Hima, Himasaki and Tyuko Sato. Sorry if I mispronounced those. 
It involves a bunch of young people, a group of young people, including the self-proclaimed mad scientist Rintaro Okabe and his friend Daru, who's kind of more of the technical expert, and they invent time communication in which you can communicate with the past on cell phones uh, through this kind of weird thing with a microwave. And what happens is that their, their friend, the lovely young Mayuri, gets killed in an accident and they go back to change time to save her. And every time they change something, something goes wrong. So they go back again and again and again and again to save Mayuri. And it's very touching, the dedication of the friend. They, they will move heaven and earth to save her life. And it's, it's very wonderful. <laughs> and uh, you'll love it. It's, it's fantastic. And so that is my list with my honorable mention. And please let me know what you think in the, in the comments below. Please like and subscribe. That helps us get out the good steampunk word for now. This is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.